Hello and welcome to the Feeder Series podcast. I'm your host, Jim Kimberley, and this week to help me dissect two crazy races in Jeddah and what lies ahead for F2 and F3 is a driver who is aiming to be in F2 very, very soon. And technically, he is the closest racer to making that step up with his current position in the F3 standings. Back for his first podcast with us since episode three, I'm delighted to say we have the current Formula 3 Championship leader joining us. Welcome back to the podcast, Gabriel Bortoletto. How are you today? Hi, Jim. Hello, everyone. So very, very happy to be part of this episode with you guys. Yeah, very good to to finally come back from episode three. You know, it was just the beginning for you guys. And now, uh, yeah, let's talk about a bit of racing and uh, let's have a nice chat. Yeah, well, I don't think we could be anywhere as close to how much success we've had since you. We have over 2,000 subscribers, 70-something thousand listens and everything. If it wasn't for you, Gabriel. So thank you for coming back. Next time, let's make sure it's not so long. And everything you're doing there free so far, I think we're going to have to get you back a few times when you win, 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 and win. But we'll talk all about that in a second, because joining Gabriel is a new name to the podcast. But for those of you who watch Transfer Weekly, you'll recognize the face and the voice. After Michael McClure made a step up to the head of copy at Feeder Series, I'm delighted to welcome the new Feeder Series F3 editor, Daniele Spaddy. Ready to talk F2 and F3, Daniele? I am. Thank you for having me. This is actually like an honor for me. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to be here and talk everything about Formula 2 and Formula 3. The honor is all mine. It's great to have you on. I was saying before we started recording that it feels like I know Daniele because I edit Transfer Weekly and he's been watching the podcast. So it's actually quite weird, eh, that we know each other but don't know each other. So this is Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, the fun of Zoom. Um, but yeah. before we get started, if you enjoy the podcast, please like, comment, and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube, or leave a rating or review if you're listening on Spotify or another podcast platform. And if you happen to be listening on Spotify or watching on YouTube, you can take part in our podcast polls that we've been running. Last week, we asked you which driver in Trident would finish highest in the F3 standings, and 58% of Spotify listeners and 53% of YouTube viewers made it very awkward for me to say by saying it was Oli Goethe, but that might be influenced by the fact he was the guest at the time. But Gabriel, don't worry. You were a close second with 33 and 43% of the vote, respectively. This week, I want to know who your driver of the weekend was in Saudi Arabia. You can head over to our YouTube channel or look below on Spotify. You can cast your vote. And while you're there, if you haven't rated or subscribed, please take the 10 seconds to do so. It really does help us out. Well, Gabrielle, it's been over a year since we had you last on, and you wouldn't know this before I told you before we just started recording, but you are first guest that we had, so all well, always welcome to come back on. But since then, since February 2022, you took Freca wins, you've joined F3, and you've become part of Al Plan with Fernando Alonso. How have things been over the last year? Yeah, things were were very different uh, from like a year ago. Um, yeah, a lot of things, as you say, it happened. Uh, uh, first of all, Freca season was not the easiest ones at the beginning. Then we had uh, some issues. Then after we fixed it, we got some poles, some wins, uh, and it was good to finish the year like that. And then we, yeah, we we found a deal with uh, Fernando uh, A14. And uh, it was good for, for both sides to, to be together in that moment. I had the opportunity to join Trident, did the pre-season test in a, a post-season test of 2022 in Jerez. We performed very well. And then we we decided to announce to the team to to sign us. And uh, and yeah, now, now we are here talking after I won my first race in Bahrain. Uh, things are going crazy for me. Um, I I hope we can keep it like this. Uh, I'm working very hard for it, honestly. Since uh, since everything started in F3, I think I never worked so so hard in my life. Um, you know, um, but I have a good opportunity, and I know it. So so yeah, a lot of things are going on now, but only good things. So I'm very happy and pleased to about it. I'm so happy for. It. I remember you told me you were going to be joining Trident, and I was like, that's 
that's a team you want to join in F3. So that was that was massively exciting. And I think it's fair to say it all started with your appearance on the podcast. So we are wholly responsible for all of the successes. And yeah, he's nodding if you are listening rather than watching. But we're going to talk about F3 and your amazing debut. But I think it's only fair to have you answer the question that I asked our audience earlier, because in F2, Ayumu Uwasa won the Jeddah sprint race in style. Then Fred Vesti looked like a new man with Prema winning the feature race. But I know you're watching. And who was your driver of the weekend and, and why, Gabriel? Honestly, it's a bit difficult to say for me. It was a crazy weekend. I think uh, there was a lot of points in the table that were left in Jeddah for them. Uh, I think last time I saw uh, Pouche after Bahrain, he was with 28 points. And now the championship leader is with 33. So, yeah, it's like five points more than Pouche that was like in, in Bahrain leading by 28. So... So yeah, I think there was many points on the table left there, but uh, honestly, I didn't understood what happened to Martin and uh, and Birman as well. For me, um, they were both the drivers at that moment until the spin of the weekend, because Birman was doing a mega race in the sprint race, and then he got hit by Pusha, uh, and then also Victor, he finished P2 in the sprint race, he did a mega race, he scored some points for the championship. And then, uh, and then, yeah. Now he was doing great in the in the feature race, and he spun. I don't know if it was some problems with the car or if it was himself, but um, for me, he deserved to be the, to to get the driver of the weekend. But at the end of the day, uh, the guy that won the race was Vesti, so I would say he was the driver of the weekend for me because he did everything that he needed to do to score the points and to finish the weekend in the good position. So yeah, uh, Vesti for me was the, the best of the weekend. Yeah, quite a lot of names you can really pull out, can't you? And I was the same. I had to do an article earlier detailing it. And it was like, yeah, I mean, for sure, even had a terrible qualifying. He did the spin and then all of a sudden comes up how many positions in the feature race. Martins did so well yeah. but from the feature. It's just so difficult to pick. And then Vesti, of course, Suasa. But not here to hear me speak, I'm just hosting. Daniele, I want to know also, how did you enjoy Saudi? And equally, who impressed you the most from, from F2's second round? I really did enjoy the weekend, actually. Uh, I think it really showed how good Saudi Arabia can be, for Formula mm -hmm. 2 especially. Uh, I think it was the best Formula 2 weekend in Saudi Arabia in the last three years that we had the racetrack in the calendar. Um, honestly, I think Frederick Vest is like the obvious choice he i think i mean i'm gonna go out on a limb and say that he would have won the race even with Batman and martins still uh in the fight i think it would have been tough for him but honestly he was i think the quicker driver the quicker driver um and i think um we have to mention gian deruval as well he's he really likes saudi arabia like especially last year, I remember he had a mega weekend and he scored two podiums this time round two. He sits fifth in the championship. And I think Visho needs a mention too. Um, he was actually like one of my dark horses for the championship at the start of the year. And he really showed, like he was the only one that made the alternative strategy work uh, in the feature race. And he was really quick. And despite the spin, he scored some decent points. So yeah, I think many drivers had a really good weekend and that just shows how good Formula 2 can be. Yeah, I feel if for sure can nail his qualifying. So he's had two poor qualifyings in a row and then just absolutely yeah. blitzes the feature race. He could really shine in the in Van Am Sport this year. But yeah, it's as you both mentioned, a, a weekend of errors for Porsche, a weekend of error for Martin, for Behrman. Um it's early in the season and it's a long season, Gabriel, but you mentioned earlier that you didn't have the best start with Freco and you kind of did better later, but does it affect your confidence this early in the season if you don't get a solid start? Would Vesti now be going into Australia with more confidence than Porsche, for example? I think when you have great results at the beginning, it's for sure you build some confidence and then it's a lot easier after. You know, you know that uh, you have the car to do it. You know that you are in the shape to do that good job, but... Uh, it all depends. Uh, honestly, 
in my case uh, last year was I was talking about it was not about confidence I think it was more problems that we had technical problems that I was giving my best and I know it I could see the data and stuff it was just some some problems that it was out of my my range to to solve it but at the end of the day uh, we managed to do it because the team worked very hard for it and I think uh, starting the season well as uh, Vesti and I did now for example uh, you were asking about Melbourne I think uh, yeah we go into Melbourne with a, a more confidence than Bahrain because you know um, in my case for Bahrain I had no idea even if I thought the days in testing in F3 like in Hades and then even in the batting pre-season test, I had no idea how it was going to be my performance in the race weekend because, you know, you you never know who, how much the others are sandbagging on the test or not. Mm -hmm. So, so like, you are, okay, I can be P1 or I can be P15 or P20, I don't know. So I went to, to the FP with this mentality and, uh, and then, yeah, I think in FP, you know, when he's handbagging a lot in that moment. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I did P1 there and I, I had the confidence for the quality. And then, yeah, we were in the front row. Uh, and now for Melbourne, I think uh, we already know a bit how to work for for making things work in Melbourne, even if it's a new track for everyone. I think this is good uh, because our team has a good preparation for, for Melbourne and uh, let's see how, how things go for that. I can't wait. I'm really excited to see <laughs> these championships head to Australia. Going to come on to F3 just after this thing, because final one from you, Danielle, that Kramer, fifth in the standings at the moment in F2, but the weekend to me, and both of you mentioning Behrman doing well, suggested that they might potentially be back to some of their recent successes that they seem to skip out on on last year. Do you think... It might be Prema versus ART for the team's championship, or is that a bit premature and maybe overlooking some other teams? Well, of course, I think it's really early right now. But honestly, it does look like a classic Prema versus ART kind of fight, doesn't it? Um, in my opinion, I think they are uh, the two best teams in recent FIDA Series history. Uh, and they are always like up there fighting for championship race wins and podiums. Uh, but honestly, I think Formula 2 really shows how good consistency and team effort can be. And if I have to like mention someone, I think Dams could have actually have like a good shot. Uh, Iwasa is having a good season so far, and he must be a championship contender this season you know they're not only for his career to progress but also for dams to fight for the championship and of course they have a good talent in Arthur Leclerc who's scoring points uh, he scored in the two feature races so he's showing a good understanding of the car and so I think they could be a good championship threat in the team standings and of course let's not forget that Campos is actually leading the, the championship right now which is kind of crazy but of course Boshing leading the drivers championship and mainly actually bagging some some good points uh, in the first two races so I think ART and Prema could potentially be the main favorites and Prema I think as the season goes on will have a better understanding of the car because of the great personnel and great uh, great general understanding of the car and the series but honestly, I think it's anyone's game right now. Exciting times, yeah. Well, well uh, remembered bringing up Yumo Was because he's the only driver to have scored in all four races so far. <laughs> that, that's, the, that's a record gone. He's the only driver who can score in all the races from here on out. So well done, Yumo. Let's move on to something that you guys might have heard of called Formula 3. Um, Bahrain, a couple of weeks ago, Gabrielle, and... You've had plenty of time by now to digest it all, I hope. And like you mentioned, you started the weekend well, front row qualification, and then you were just a smidge off getting pole position as well. Then you led the race, then a safety car came out, and then you stopped leading the race, but then you won the race anyway. That's how you start a season. Uh, how, how was that weekend for you? I know we spoke about your season last year, but how was Bahrain specifically? Yeah, as I said, Bahrain was was a crazy weekend. Uh, I think uh, the expectations for me uh, before the Bahrain GP, I, I didn't know what to think and what to expect, honestly, from the race weekend. The only thing that was in mind is I want to score as much uh, as much points I can to be well placed in the championship, and you know, 
because looking at even at the the previous years uh, we saw that uh, like it's important in this championship to score as much points as you can because it can make a lot of difference at the end of the year one or two points so so yeah going into Bahrain doing like second in the quality uh, and then jump into first in the first corner um and then I pulled the gap for Gabri and uh, also for Gregoire. So, so yeah, I had the margin of, I think, around four or five seconds, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and, uh, and, yeah, in that moment, I was, like, just trying to manage the gap or not push so much in the tires to because I knew that to take out four seconds during a race is not the easiest of the, of the jobs because I knew that my pace was good, so... So yeah, but I honestly was expecting at some point a safety car. It's almost impossible to have a race without safety car. So I was like, okay, at some point probably will come and I need to be ready for this. And I knew that Mini had a penalty as well. He had five seconds. So so yeah, in the safety car we started it quite quite well, I think, for the first straight. And then in the second one, uh Gabriel managed to do the switch back on me in T4. And uh, I didn't even try, to, honestly, to to keep so much the position after I saw that he was in my side because as I knew that he had the penalty. I just said, okay, I need to be inside the DRS zone for the whole race and I will win. And, and that was the case. I think I was in the DRS zone until the last lap of the race. And, uh, and yeah, nothing too much to say about it. I think it was... Uh, I had some opportunities during the race to to make a move on him but uh, you don't want it to risk as well because you know you never know when the guy has a penalty what is going <laughs> to happen there so so yeah I, the... I managed to do the fastest lap and 25 points from the win so it was good there's a driver who was before your time gabriel who always did exactly what he needed to and didn't have to go anywhere above Alan Prost, you know, I don't know if you've heard of this guy, and it sounds like you've got the same sort of mentality, so that that says a lot. Quick question on the safety car. Do you think, with the way the tyre deck is in F3, if the safety car didn't come out, you could have retained the lead if there was no safety cars through the feature race? I, if I could keep the lead, yes, mm -hmm. I think so. Honestly, I don't think he would catch me. Uh, that's, that's my opinion, but we never know. Uh, it didn't happen, so... <laughs> But I think I think my pace was good. Um, even like I, I say this because when I was behind of him, I managed to be inside the DRS the whole race, and he didn't pull any gap on me. So that's what makes me feel like that I had the even if he had clean air in front, he didn't manage to 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 pull the gap on me. So yeah, I would say that I I wouldn't like get more three four seconds on him. I think I would still the same for. Mm -hmm three seconds but uh I, I think it's quite difficult to take four seconds out in a race it can happen but in that case i think we were very similar in the race pace i think gabriel, so uh. gabriel i just have to say just from speaking to you a year ago to today the confidence difference that you've got is so notable it's like so encouraging to see and just i remember watching a rival called Screaming Meals, another podcast and i remember armstrong saying you don't have to put a kid in a car to know if they're gonna do well you just speak to them and you can tell if they're if they've got the confidence they either got it or not you've got it right now son so i can't wait to see how you do this year <laughs> let me switch to you daniele and then i want to hear more obviously from from your side on the season gabrielle but daniele it's your first weekend covering f3 for feeder series so you had the pleasure of of speaking to to gabrielle in the press conference you got to speak to top three drivers in the feature, uh, sprint race, sorry, we're just saying how you didn't have the feature race, but what can you tell us from the inside of the F3 side? How, how did you enjoy it? What did you learn from, from covering it for the first time? I think um, Formula 3 is definitely regarded as one of the most chaotic championships in the feeder series ladder. And, and although that's true, uh, I think this, this weekend was a bit more on a calmer side. I think everyone was kind of trying to learn the car as quickly as possible of course we have like 17 new rookies so it's very difficult for drivers to get to know the car really quickly and kind of be on pace right from the start for example gabriel did that perfectly but not everyone was like on the same page um but i think we we really saw what formula 3 can bring this season i think it can really be one of the best 
years for the championship because we have so many different drivers who could potentially challenge for race wins and podiums. And although we've seen like a couple of main names during the weekend, maybe stand out from the others, I think there are at least like a good 10, 12 drivers who could potentially be in the championship fight come the end of the season in Monza. So I... I think we have a really good season on our hands. And honestly, it was a bit of a hectic weekend, not going to lie, but it was a really enjoyable one. And honestly, I just hope for more, the, more of the same in the in the next few rounds. It's so good. F3 is, it, it was is. last year. This year, I think it's going to be the same. My favorite championship by far. And like you say, so many good drivers in it. Let's yeah. talk about Trident then, Gabriel. We mentioned... Kramer and ART in Formula 2 have always been right at the top and almost classic teams. Trident are the F3 powerhouse or one of the F3 powerhouses. And you've moved from, I don't know if you were physically living there, but you moved from France to, or from a French team to an Italian team. And you were one of the first announcements, I think, if not the first announcement following the postseason test. So you and Trident just seem to gel immediately. How are things? How are things switching to Trident? Did it just click for you to want to sign so early? Can you talk, talk us through how it all came about? I, I think uh, when when the like FIF three post goes on Instagram announcing the drivers, it's, it's probably after two months that a driver has signed already. So even if I was the first to to sign with Trident, like to sign a. Uh, the how do I say it? Um, I was the first to go on media and say, okay, I'm first racing announcement. in the FIA. Yeah, first announcement, exactly. Uh, I was not the first one to sign because I I know it because uh, at the middle of the season, at the summer break, uh, I hadn't signed anything yet, but we were looking at some teams, and uh, and yeah, a lot of teams were already signed and uh, with some drivers. Uh, I think full Prema and most of ART and uh, luckily uh, I think a bit of Trident as well was already signed but it was a bit crazy because after Maloney did well I don't know if he was supposed to another another year in F3 and then he went to F2 it was a bit of a confusion I think for everyone in the paddock in every team because I'll probably also for Prema with Beerman you know because he did well at the end of the season and he moved to F2 so so yeah um, everything started with me um, when I won Barcelona or Spa in Freca. Yeah, so basically the seats were already, some of the seats were already signed and uh, we were deciding what, where to go. And there was a still seat in Trident. Uh, they were interested in me and I was very interested in them because I know how the team is capable of doing well. And uh, they were like, okay, the first half of the season, they were good. But at the last half, when Maloney won the three last feature races, it was crazy. But, but I've already almost signed with them before this. So it was like a bit of... Uh, it was a routine. Yeah. But like I was... Some, my, my instinct was telling me to go for it. And I am a guy that is a lot like this. I follow my instincts. And, and something was telling me, okay, go for it, go for it. Even because it's an Italian team and now I'm living in Milan, it's I can be close to the team. I can go there every day if I want. And it's good also for me, you know. And uh, and then, yeah, also uh, Albert, my manager, you know, with Fernando in A14, uh, he was confident about this decision. And then we say, okay, we go for it. And uh, we did the postseason test. Uh, and we were basically already signed, but uh, it, after the postseason test was just uh, okay, we go for it. It's very good, and uh, and that that was the decision. I think, uh, and I think it was a good one. I tell you something. I'm not a manager in Formula Three, but if or a driver manager, but if you ever have the opportunity to join Trident in F3, you take that immediately. So I think you made the right decision, Gabriel. Absolutely. Final thing for from sure. you, Daniele. If Free heads to Melbourne next, uh, supporting the Australian Grand Prix. And I'm sure we're going to have you on the podcast throughout the season. Now you are doing F3 this year, but until we get you, what do you expect from the upcoming Australian race and the future rounds? Honestly, I think Australia could potentially be one of the best tracks on the calendar for Formula 3. I think with the recent changes last season, it has really 
changed uh, the way the, the drivers see the track. And of course, for Formula 3 drivers, it's going to be the first time in Australia. So um, we've spoken we've spoken with, um, with team managers and drivers alike and in the last few weeks. And we've seen and heard that they all think that um, adaptation will be key the, in the next weekend. And I think that's the case because no one knows the track. No one knows the secrets uh, behind it. And I think maximizing track time will be key. Absolutely. And I think we're going to we're gonna see a lot of running uh, in free practice and qualifying, for example, perhaps even on the same set of tires, just because the drivers need to get uh, acclimatized to the track a lot more compared, for example, to Bahrain, where they have had the experience from preseason testing or perhaps also earlier seasons in Formula 3 and feeder series categories uh, to go off of. So I think Australia will definitely be a, a good race. Not so much for like European fans with the time zones, etc. But we're definitely used to that uh, with, with Formula 3 and other series. So I think that's going to be the least of our problems. But yeah, I think... For Australia especially, adaptation will be key. And then for the next few rounds of the championship, consistency, of course, will be the main the main word uh, for the championship. Just because we have so many different drivers that could potentially be uh, race-winning candidates, etc. I think consistently being in the points in both the sprint race and the feature race will be definitely the main talking point of the season. Right, that's enough questions from me because the Feed Series podcast is for you, viewers and listeners. We're going to move on to the Ask FS part of the podcast. If this is your first time watching or listening, you can get involved by using the hashtag AskFS on Twitter, joining our Discord and using the podcast questions channel, commenting on our YouTube videos, or by keeping an eye out on our Instagram posts and stories. The first question's slightly different and everything may go wrong, but I'm about to try and give this question to you, Gabrielle. This is somebody who really wants to know. No way. <laughs> no way, this guy, unbelievable. So if you are listening, not watching, Oli Goethe has just appeared on Gabrielle's screen and he wants to ask this question. So a uh, question to whoever is next on the podcast. Uh, I'm going to put you on the spot. And uh, what's your top three predictions for uh, F3 2023? That's what Mr. Goethe <laughs> wants to know. <laughs> he didn't know it was going to be you, else I think you might have had a more embarrassing question. But I think that's a good question nonetheless. Oh, Okay, first position, uh, I need to be confident on myself. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I need to say myself because, uh, because yeah, uh, I think uh, like second and third, my is difficult. Um, I'm going to say full try the lineup because this, that's my <laughs> dream you know, to, to finish. P1, T2, and P3 in the championship. So, yeah, I don't care if it's Oli or, or Forna in P2 or P3. Uh, just one of them in the top, just both in the top three. That's That's a, that is a very clever answer. I'm going to twist it slightly to put, the, to put pressure on you and say, you're obviously first place, but then who would be in second and third place if there were no other Trident drivers? Okay, okay, Jim, Jim, you are putting me in a difficult position now. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think um, Peganovic, I would say that would be there in top three, um, maybe second. He's uh, he's very intelligent on doing championship points. Mm. I think uh, Premo was not the strongest team in Bahrain, but he still managed to go out of the championship in third position after the first round. So, so yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know. Maybe... I'm going to put two drivers now in the top three because I think they, they are capable to be there. I think um, Mini, because he showed that he's quick in the first round, mm. and I think they are they are quite good. So the team as well and everything. So I think he will be there. And um, and I hope Kyle Collett as well. You know, mm. uh, third season, even if the team is has never been in the top three in the past years in 
the proper F3 FIA championship. I think he's capable of, he's a very good driver. He's talented, so, and he has a lot of experience. So I think he has the opportunity to be there. Repping Frecker in Brazil. I'm going to say that you went above and beyond with Kyle because I said you obviously get a winner, only needed two names, but it's nice to see that Brazilian love being shared. There's quite a few questions from Brazilians coming up as well. The next question kind of merges into three um, because it's all around the same thing. So I'm going to ask all three of them uh, because I do want to get as many questions from the fans out as possible. So Isaac Hajar's number two fan asked via Discord, have you had talks with any academies yet slash are you interested in joining an F1 academy? R. Muller on Twitter says, do you think without an academy you'll have a chance of an F1 seat? Do you have any open talks with any F1 young driver program? And I am angry via Discord. If you could go to any F1 academy, which one would you go to? So all kind of the same thing. I guess the question boils down to... Are there any conversations? Where would you go if you could choose, et cetera? Mm, I think uh, what I can say for now is that I don't have any any talks with anyone. Uh, I think, I've, you know, you need to get some good results to start some conversation like this. I think batting was the first step that we did as a good result, but it's the first of many that we need to do if we want to join an academy, honestly. So I would... I would say um the best academy to join today is the best one like is the one that has a spot free in, like as a seat in f1 for you in a few years so i i would not say any name because uh, honestly i have no idea how is the changing of seats going on um i like red bull that's what i can say because I think they've put some some drivers in the past in, in F1 and they have two teams, so AlphaTauri and Red Bull, so they have uh, extra seats, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. comparing to the others. But we never know. Uh, I think uh, it all depends from the offer that they are going to give to you. Um, I would like to join a team, in a junior team. But honestly, if it doesn't happen as well, uh, I'm not uh, concerned about it. Uh, I have a very, very, very good management. And at the end of the day, uh, that's what matters for me. You know, Fernando has, has uh, all the contacts as possible in the paddock. So I was about uh, to say, I remember Alonso sort of stepped aside at one point with um, letting... Uh, the future kind of coming with signs, I think it was. Not that I was thinking he's going to move away for it, but you never know. You know, come 2025, Alonso's got two championships this year, next year. He's had enough. Steps aside for the young Brazilian hotshot. Could be the could be the way forward. It could be Al Plan. The question from Cesar Valero, um, who asked this on Twitter and on Instagram, so really wants to know, do you have any hidden talents? That's a good one. It is. Because I don't think I have it. <laughs> I think um, basically everything that I do in my life is about racing. So so it's difficult to answer this one. I like some other sports, but I don't think I'm talented <laughs> enough to, to say it, you know? So I... Um, I'll give you some examples I like to... in case you don't okay. know. So I know Dennis Hauger can juggle. I know Oli Goethe and I know Gabriel Mini can do a Rubik's Cube. Mini very quickly as well. Okay. Yeah, and I know Mini, yeah. There was something else I just thought of as well, which was an odd one, which people... It's the sort of thing... Oh, that was it. Victor Martin, very good at cooking, apparently. I've never tasted his food. But these are things that you don't necessarily know. And I think he was doing gymnastics as well uh, from an interview that he told me before. So following in uh, Senna's footsteps there, but anything on your side that people maybe just don't know unless they really follow on, on your social media that you do in your spare time, maybe, that you're good at? Normally, I don't post this on Instagram, but I, I like to cook, honestly. Mm. Um, but uh, only the only person in the world that say that my my, my my food is good is my mother, so <laughs> I'm not sure that she's it's so good like it. <laughs> but I like to cook, so... so it, and I, I like to like to spend my time, uh, my free time sometimes doing that. So yeah, you're in Italy I would now. You have to cook properly. Some good pasta pomodoro, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. 
Well, so that's a, a big nod from Danielle, who's also got the next couple of questions, Absolutely. if you'd be so kind. Yeah, of course. So we have a question from Tro Hoxio from Discord. I hope I, I pronounced their name correctly. And they want to say, is the Formula 3 car hard to drive? And tied to this one, Srihari Desai wants to know the biggest change from Freca to Formula 3 that you've noticed so far. Well, I think the, the F3 car is, is difficult, but um, I wouldn't say it's more difficult than Freca or something. It's all about adaptation in the car. F3 has more power and downforce at the end of the day, but uh, I honestly like it. Uh, and, and I think I've adapted myself to, uh, to this car in the way that I like. I think it's the biggest difference between Freck and F3 is that the car has a lot more power uh, out of the corners and also top speed when you turn on the DRS, uh, you can really feel the, the power coming in. And uh, and yeah, high speed uh, corners you can do a lot, a lot quicker than the Freca. So yeah, that that feeling when you turn the car and immediately turn and you know you just carry and carry more and more speed in the corner, and you need to believe that the car is going to do it because he is. So so yeah, that that's the feeling of the F three, and I think this is the main difference on F three. I have a follow up question. Sorry, Daniel, I know you've got the next one, but push to pass versus DRS. What's is there a massive difference that you can feel with the opening the rear wing compared to a bit of extra power? For sure, yeah. The push to pass is not something that you feel massively. Like you click and then you feel the power coming in, but very progressively and the difference is not big. You just feel when you have a car in front that is not using it. The DRS, no, immediately when you turn it on, you feel like the thing going just like... Fast and the Furious and DOS. Yeah, <laughs> it's like uh, DRS. You immediately feel, and uh, the 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 mass is the difference of like top speed is massive between a car that doesn't use DRS or it uses. So that's why overtakes in F three are a lot easier as well than in Freca. Excellent, thank you, Daniele. Please continue. Yes, we do have another question from our Discord server, and Mood wants to know how has the first round helped you on up to your understanding of the tires in Formula Three? Um, I think uh, tires is not on my side to understand so well. For sure, I understand the basics of the tires and and uh, a bit how it works, like uh, how much grip and when does the best lap comes normally when do you need to push when do you need to cool down but like the proper uh like uh inside a lot of things that the team like is the is the team engineers that do they they really go forwards on trying to understand better and better the tires because this is a big difference in f3 if you know how to to work on it so so yeah i would say that the only thing that we get uh, as a driver is more confidence because we don't have so much time on track with these tires because even with, with, if we tested GP3 at the end of last season, uh, we cannot use that tires because you cannot find them. So you use another compound. So, so yeah, you just feel more confident on pushing in that tires. That, that's it. Fascinating stuff. I love these sorts of... Um perspectives that you don't really get when you just watch a racing and you hear it from you. So I'm really enjoying this, Gabriel. The next question is from Jaiku. I think it is Jaiku99 by Discord. Very good question as well. If you could be teammates with Senna or Massa, who would it be? Bah, Senna. Uh, like Massa is a legend for me. He's, he's one of the best Brazilians that ever been. But I think Senna is just someone that's uh, I didn't manage to to like. I I I'm born ten years after his his death. So so yeah. Um, I would like to know him as a person. Massa Felipe, Felipe Massa. I know him as a person. Uh, he's a very nice guy, uh, and he was an F one legend. I can say even if he was not a world champion, I think uh he showed that he could have been a lot of years in a row. So. So yeah, I think Senna because he's a legend in in the sport, and everyone thinks that he's the best of all time. And I agree with with this. So I would like to learn. I think it's a very clever answer. How how things work in that time. 
I think it's a very clever answer when you say that you already know Felipe, so you get to actually speak to Ayrton. I mean, that's very um, astute of you to actually figure out that you, you can have the best of both worlds almost. Although he would be a teammate, which might be very frustrating to be up against Seda, but you never know. You never know. I, I didn't. I didn't think on that way, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's probably like I would get my my career destroyed after that. But <laughs> <laughs> Team Brazil, though, vamos, vamos. Um, Bala um, on Twitter wants to know what it's like to be managed by Fernando Alonso and the A14 team. Is he giving you personal feedback or revealing any of his secrets? And equally, tell us via Discord, who starts his message, Bortoletto, there's about 50 O's. Ask him about being managed by Fernando Alonso has helped him start in F3. So questions about El Plan, I guess, and how it is with, with Fernando, if you have any relationship or if it's mainly just with A14 management. I've said this in the past already, uh, and I keep always repeating this. I think this is um, the best thing that's happened in my career until now. Uh, I think everything that's happened after he joined my career uh the a14 not just fernando because sometimes people think that he's just fernando but no there is some uh, there is albert and alberto behind uh they are also the owners of a14 uh fernando is uh, like i'm uh, every weekend i am in contact with him about mm -hmm. uh, asking things even in bahrain before my qualify i text him about to know a bit better about the track uh, evolution and stuff if he told me, look, I will be doing my FP now because it was, I think, just FP2. Uh, and I would not have time to text you after the FP2 to tell you about the track, but I can tell you a bit of things that will probably happen hmm. because he has so much experience that he know how the track will evolve probably. So, so yeah, I think uh, he, he told me some stuff to do and I did. And honestly, it worked. Uh, and it was a very, very good thing to, to try on track. And it was immediately on quality, so so yeah. Um, but I think after he joined my career, I managed to to sign in a team in a team that I always dreamed to to join as a Trident. Uh, as I said before in the podcast, I think it's a top team, and uh, they showed this in the past. And I'm in Trident today because of them, because of a fourteen. Because I don't think I would have get the seat if it was not because of uh, of them. So yeah uh it's very good also because fernando has so much experience he can teach us a lot not just me also the other f a14 drivers they, he teaches us a lot of things he he has so much experience sometimes it's even too much that uh, i don't know it's just it, it's just nice to be around and and you know two times world champion and one of the best of all time in my opinion well, so, yeah. judging by Bahrain's opening round, you forget the idea of driver academies and just look at A14 management and that's where you find your F3 winners with you and Pepe doing go so well in, uh, in Bahrain, the sprint in the future race. So no, that sounds, you sound so happy. So congratulations. Um, Daniele, we've got a couple more questions from you as well. Yes. Uh, Stein MS34 Supremacy would like to know uh, that every... Formula 3 rookie always talks about just how wide Bahrain is. Have you driven on a circuit as wide and is it better or worse than tight local circuits? Uh, it, it depends. Bahrain is wide, but the, at, at the same time, it's not so wide like this. Because, for example, in Sector 1, it's like very big and you have margin, like a lot of margin. But then you go into Sector 2, you know, the fast chicken and then T8, T9. It's not so wide like this. You don't have so much margin to do any mistake. Maybe you go wide and then, you, okay, you have some escape area. But it's not that, okay, you did a mistake. You don't lose time by doing it. So, so yeah, I think the track is, is it's normal, I would say. Uh, I like the track. It's, it's a nice track. Not my favorite one. But, yeah, nothing special, nothing so different from what I'm used to. Yeah, of course. And Mugello. also, Mugello, sorry, sorry for it, but Mugello, oh, yeah. it's no, a no. Very wide track. Yeah, it is, you especially just... for like smaller cars as well. Yeah, you just want to impress the Italians. Wide... That's all you're doing here, <laughs> and it's working. <laughs> <laughs> so you're gonna say something, Gabriella, before I rudely interrupted you about Mugello, maybe? 
No, no, I, I just say that uh, he has about Bahrain being wide. I think Mugello is a lot, it seems at least a lot wider to drive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a track that you have a lot of track and stuff. So, so yeah, in my opinion, Mugello is the widest track I've driven until now. Pretty damn wide. Um, Daniel, I think there's one more from you as well. Yes, Sir Callan Edwards uh, from Discord would like to ask, did you expect coming into round one in Bahrain that you would qualify second and win the feature race? Mm, no. Um, I was expecting maybe to to do good, but uh, from the previous test that, we did, that we've done, but uh, if someone told me, look, you're going to qualify in the front row and you're going to win the first feature race of the season, I, I don't know if like it's a rookie season you know it's like very difficult to to believe in something like this but yeah it happened so i'm very happy <laughs> the zane maloney way of doing things start winning in the rookie season you never know what's going to happen for trident um <laughs> the next question is not a question but i had to include it because it's from rapini bull shark via discord and starts a message not a question just wishing you good luck and always remember we brazilians will always be with you regardless of position race pace and everything and then i'm not going to embarrass myself by pronouncing the portuguese it comes after but it's got two brazilian emoji flags i just wanted to make sure you knew that there's another question though <clears throat> from thank you a brazilian there you go um, of Rapini as a thank you, but from Fernandez, first of all, congrats on winning the first race. I was cheering for you and I'm from Sao Paulo too, ha ha ha. So I like your aggressiveness on the track and I really hope you can fight for the title this year. Do you think that's possible seeing Trident's evolution and performance? So fighting for the title. Um, first of all, yeah, thank you for the support and nice to know that you are from Sao Paulo. Uh, yeah, my hometown as well uh but yes i think we can fight for the championship yes is that you thinking we as in we trident or is in we a14 gabriel bortoletto i think it's the same thing at the end of the day a14 gabriel bortoletto and trident uh we are our team so when i i think when i say we it's uh me my team because yeah they, they've showed the potential anyway uh and A14, uh, I think I can speak by myself, not by like uh, Pepe and Nicola side, but I think, yeah, uh, myself, I can fight for the championship if that was the question, yeah. That's the right answer as well, I'd say. There's another <clears throat> question from Racing From A Girl who asks questions very regularly. Thank you, Racing From A Girl. Do you miss your old teammates in Freca? Um, yeah, they they were nice, you know. I think we had some good times together. Uh, I think um, I didn't spend so much time so much time with them outside of the track. Mm. But yeah, normal. I would say I like them, but nothing uh, that I miss. I I don't miss uh, something like ah. Oh, I I want them to be on track now. Yeah. I hope they, they do well this year on whatever they are driving. But like I, I honestly like my teammates from this year as well. We we have spending more time together uh this year than what I've spent time with my last year teammates. So yeah. Yeah, Ollie was very effusive about how much he's enjoying working with you last week. I will highlight. So it seems to be one happy trident family. Last couple of questions from you, Daniel, if you would be so kind again. Of course, we have some lighthearted questions now. Uh, CM Parfait 16 from Discord would like to ask which Trident personnel has the best sense of humor right now? Uh, which uh, driver, oh sorry, which driver, no, which uh, person, either driver personnel, or mechanic yeah. or anyone like who is the most funniest one? Yeah, okay. Um, man, in Trident, there are so many, so I, I need to think who is the funniest one, but <laughs> I think I would say Jack. Giacomo is one of the funniest ones because he's always pushing us to, to work. So he look at us and the first thing that he says is like in Italian, no lavorare, no lavorare. It's like work, work, work. <laughs> and he's always saying that. So like even sometimes not even good morning. It's just like work, work. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, my teammate Forna, he's very, very funny. 
like uh, he's yeah it's it's very good to work with this type of personalities in the team it, it makes the team better and and like happiness inside the team you know so i think them uh and also roman stanek he's very nice and mm -hmm. and punny as well yeah then three i think is the top three of trident uh, uh <laughs> trident for his guys <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's also like the Italian way of working to like bring a bit of fun into it and just like motivating guys with, with a bit of funny jokes as well. And Vishred would like to know what languages do you speak and are you learning any of them right now? Well, right now I'm not learning anything new, um, but I speak uh, Portuguese, Italian, English. And uh, I think if I go to Spain, for example, I think I can... I, I can speak a bit. Uh, I'm not fluent in Spanish, but I can, yeah. I can talk with someone and stuff, um, but nothing else than this. I didn't learn anything in French last year, just some little words uh, like poulet, uh, ça va bien, uh, je m'appelle, uh, some, I don't know, something like this. But no, yeah, that I would say I speak fluent three languages. Well, from what I've seen with Fernando Lance, you just start saying um, for sure before all the words and that's you speaking Spanish. So for sure you can speak Spanish. For sure you're going to win the championship. <laughs> that's that's Alonso Spanish. For sure. <laughs> for sure, exactly. <laughs> Daniele is completely correct because these are some light-hearted questions and I think we can whiz through these final ones. CM Parfait 16's second question. What's your favourite type of milk? Have you ever heard of or tasted a goat's milk? And then wants to specify that yes, actual goat milk exists. Difficult question that one because I'm not a specialist on milk, so <laughs> I just buy whatever there is in the supermarket, you know. And uh, because honestly, I don't I don't drink so much milk. When I was like younger, uh, I I mean, I was used to drink a lot of milk with chocolate in the morning, like every every day in my life. But then by some reason, in a month to the other, I started hating to drink milk with chocolate. I don't know why, what happened. But yeah, but then I if I drink with milk, I do some uh, very, very hot chocolate, then I, I still like a bit. But uh, not in specific, uh, specific brand or something like this. No, I mean, I don't have it. Sorry and absolutely for, no for goat milk, right? No goat milk. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say it, but yeah. Uh, Simpafes, I think, wants somebody to say yes, because he's asked this question a few times. Still haven't found anybody. Um, speaking of questions asked a few times, Ashley via Discord wants to know, what is your favourite type of cheese? Parmigiano. No. Yeah, Parmigiano is a cheese, no? Parmesan, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Parmesan. Same yeah. as Oli Goethe as well, just in case you didn't know. Yeah, man, I don't, we are in Italy, so I think this is the most famous one. I think so. I I, I hope I don't offend uh, Daniela. Please answer <laughs> uh, you're mm -hmm. completely right on this one, yeah. Okay, so perfect. So yeah, that's my my favorite one. When I go to supermarket, I take this one. and Yeah, it's good, you know, to take a cheese with a bit of uh, tomato in the afternoon, something like this, just to chill. And, yeah. <laughs> You already are Italian, I can tell. Um, the final question from Stein MS44 Supremacy. Again, a regular question that we get on the podcast and some wild answers. What color is your toothbrush? My what? Your toothbrush. Um, it depends because I change often, you know. I don't like to use the same for like uh, five months, so yeah. Uh, the one that I'm using now is actually blue and white, light blue. Uh, but the one from before was red. Uh, but now that you say, I'm going to change it again because. Was... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like that you went for the trident colors with the blue and white. Exactly, and white. I was thinking that too. It's very clear. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. I think next time you have to go for yellow for the feeder series colors. Can you can you promise a yellow toothbrush as your next toothbrush? Yes, I promise. I promise that the next one I will <laughs> I will post a photo on Instagram. I will take it like look yellow one. I don't know if the toothbrush question could get any better than that. So perfect time to end the podcast. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining. And thank you for everybody watching and listening. If you'd like to have your question asked on a future episode, use the hashtag AskFS on Twitter. Drop any questions below if you're watching on YouTube. You can respond to our Instagram stories or posts. 
or you can let us know what questions you have on your mind on our Discord. Look for the podcast questions channel. And if you are watching on YouTube, dropping a like on the video, leaving a comment and subscribing all really helps us out. If you're listening, leave a review on the podcast platform you're listening on. We greatly appreciate it. Finally, check out feederseries.net for more feeder series insight, including the words of a certain Daniel Ispadi, who will be posting onto feederseries.net. And you can follow feeder underscore series, FS Americas, and feeder series now on Twitter. You can find the links to all of those, plus the Twitter accounts for myself and everyone else on the podcast in the YouTube description or the podcast show notes. Until next time, we have been the Feeder Series Podcast. Goodbye. Thank you.